Manafort served as Donald's campaign manager in 2016, likely because of his ties to Russian oligarchs. He also passed confidential campaign polling data to somebody he thought was a Russian intelligence officer. Manafort is a convicted criminal who was pardoned by Donald, but now he's back with a business consulting service. John Eastman, architect of a strategy to help Donald overturn the election that culminated in the January 6th insurrection, is in Wisconsin trying to convince the state's assembly speaker to nullify the results of the 2020 election. This despite the fact that a judge ruled he has to turn over certain documents to the January 6th committee under the crime fraud exception because there's no confidentiality. The judge basically ruled that the documents Eastman has outline crimes he may have committed with one of his clients. Jared Kirshner has received a $2 billion investment from a fund led by Mohammed bin Salman, a Saudi prince, and the man behind the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. This was done over the objections of the fund's advisors, who basically concluded that Jared has no experience and is a PR risk. So the question is, is that money for services already rendered, or is it for services to be rendered at some future date? Let's not forget that Jared had access to the most sensitive documents pertaining to American national security for top secret clearance that was rejected by White House security experts. But Donald overruled them despite their objections. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, demonstrably one of the greatest traitors to America since Robert E. Lee, is currently running for president. Make no mistake, if these people, along with the man most responsible for elevating and enabling them, aren't held accountable, they will be running this country again in less than three years. And they will destroy it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this second strategy session of the Mary Trump Show. There are 211 days until the 2022 midterms, and two things we know right now. One, American democracy is in real danger. Two, in November 2022, the Democrats need to win races at every level of government and hold on to, or preferably expand its razor-thin margins in the House and Senate. There's one very important thing that we don't know. How the hell are we going to make sure that second thing happens? Joining me tonight to talk about all of this is my extraordinary panel, starting off with Marissa Rothkoff, who's been a regular writer for places like the New York Times and Newsweek. She's also the creator and host of The Secret Life of Cookies podcast and The Secret Life of Cookies newsletter. Also joining us uh, is former Republican, current pro-democracy activist and co-host of The Suburban Women Problem, Rachel Vindman and Adam Parkomenko, a Ukrainian American political strategist, longtime aide to Hillary Clinton and organizer who served as national field director for the Democratic National Committee in 2016. Adam has been instrumental in electing progressive Democratic candidates Currently, he volunteers as a spokesperson to United Help Ukraine. Welcome, everybody. It is so great to have you here, although I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, which is to say, with democracy on life support. <laughs> um, so I actually, one of the reasons I thought this would be an interesting panel is because um, I think you guys all live in the suburbs, um, and I just escaped from them. Adam, you might be a little farther out from the suburbs, but no, um, he's clearly he's still in the suburbs. Oh, you are okay. I thought I thought he might be like in the country, but um, I mean, not America. The country sucked. <laughs> um, we haven't moved to Maryland yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and one thing I I realized talking to all of you and other people who in who uh, live in suburbs that were very different from the one I lived in is that. Um, 
we can't just talk about suburban people as a monolith because they're very, very different. And I've noticed that people who are from suburbs outside of New York, at least, or at least unlike the one I lived in for far too long, um, are much more open-minded than I am. Uh, and I'm really <laughs> trying to work on that, but I wanted to start here. Uh, Rachel, you have a podcast called The Suburban Women Problem. Um, the suburban, suburban women as voters are also a huge problem for Democrats. In fact, mm-hmm. you and your husband, Alex Vidman, and Adam were very active in the Virginia gubernatorial campaign for Terry McAuliffe. Um, and something went very, very wrong. So given everything that's at stake right now, what's your... What's your assessment? I'm not going to ask for a prescription. I think we're, we're a little too far out for that. But what's your assessment of um, points of opportunity, perhaps, uh, that the Democrats can exploit? And I mean that in a good way. So I think when you look at groups like Moms for Liberty, who desperately want everyone to believe that they are this grassroots movement of crazy, but it's actually a top-down movement of crazy. And it was started in a DC tank think tank, probably by foreign money with four, you know, certainly with the help of foreign money, because we know all these people take money. These groups take um, money from overseas. So, and it's part of a long plan and strategy uh, to win the suburban vote to, uh, t- to, mm, I can't think of uh, to get, get, promote school choice, um, really to denigrate the public school system. And this has been going, and they've had a long-term strategy, and this is kind of a culmination of sorts. So I think really, you know, the, the group that I work with is very active in Ohio, Red, Wine, and Blue. They produce my podcast. And they have seen so much success with just pushing back on book bans, showing up. Um, there's a, a, a library council. I didn't even know these things existed. And Moms for Liberty tried to take it over this weekend in Hudson, Ohio. And they showed up and they stopped them. It's very easy to stop these groups, but they're counting on us not participating. So I really think if we show up and participate, that is an excellent way um, to one, we're, we're hitting at their morale because although they are groups that are started in DC and by other people, they do rely on some people on the ground because all the money in the world. And Adam can tell you, I mean, there were, there were races here in Virginia when the candidates went door to door, when they actually countered some of these like, you know, major heritage donations, heritage foundation donations, um, they uh, like Dan Helmer is someone I can think of. Like when he went door to door and talked to people, he was easily able to win. That's what it takes. So, um, you know, and Terry McAuliffe had some issues. And by the way, people are already seeing through Glenn Youngkin. I'm sure Adam's seen the polling. I've read the polling. Yeah. They already see that he's a fraud. It's not hard. So, uh, you know, they're, they're realizing they didn't get what they voted for. So I think we, we have to keep talking about these issues. Um, like, don't fall for it. And, um, and then really working on the ground, the local ground game. Yeah. In fact, um, hopefully we won't have COVID to deal with because that was a big issue. Um, you know, Democrats weren't willing to go out and get people sick with COVID and Republicans Mm -hmm. didn't care. Yeah. Um, You know, we definitely, there are definitely structural disadvantages that the Democrats have, which we will get to, but Adam, I wanted to get back to something Rachel just said, which is, that Virginia voters are now realizing that Glenn Youngkin wasn't anything that he pretended to be. Why do we always wait until it's too late? In fact, <laughs> there, there was plenty of evidence ahead of time. Is it messaging? Is it uh, the fact that the media doesn't seem to understand how to explain things to people? Or is it the fact that um, everything, because there's been no accountability, everything about the last administration has kind of been normalized. So people people really do think, you know, it's just another election. Democrats won uh, the 
White House. So, of course, a Republican's going to win the gov- the gubernatorial race in Virginia. Yeah, I think it, it's probably a combination of three things. And I'll start with saying, um, uh, like Rachel, I was a volunteer and I did anything and everything I could. I think the you know 2021 election for me was probably the one of the worst elections and one of the best elections because we lost in Virginia. I also met the love of my life uh, through a campaign in Virginia. That's right. Um, which was great. Who cares about uh, democracy in Virginia? You know? I don't felt love. And Live for the our, moment. Allie's amazing. So yeah, thank you, and yeah, she's the best. Might have been worth it. I think in a nutshell, it's because we don't listen to people like Rachel. And I say that as a consultant who, you know, was in Virginia and did whatever I could do. But you know. I, I'm going to get the date wrong. I want to say it was probably late August or late September. Rachel was flagging every day exactly what was going wrong um, in these areas that we needed to win. And, you know, we get focused on other things and you go to the doors and, and people are talking about what Rachel's flagging when it comes to schools. And there is this dark money behind it. And, you know, um, you could have 10 people show up and, and ruin something that's a, you know, a DC based group or something else, but, but it resonates when they have these, you know, it's the same thing. We talk about every election, these bumper sticker slogans. And I think two pieces. One, I don't want to like take away from the fact that, you know, Terry, I believe, got more votes than, you know, any Democrat in the history of Virginia. But Glenn Young can got more. Um, and <laughs> the other piece is historically in Virginia, we lose the seat um, when we win the White House. However, Virginia Democrats have been doing a great job. Um, but things changed uh, after Trump. And, and, and I've said, and I hate Uh, saying this uh, with you, Mary, uh, because of the last name. But, you know, I've I've said a long time, Trumpism is here to stay. If it was Mary Trumpism that's here to stay, we'd love it. Uh, (laughs) But You never know. (laughs) um, You know, they, so long story short, I think that we need to, we need to spend less time focused on, uh, it's almost like if you had the, the CIA and you had a bunch of people on the ground. Are we listening to, you know, sort of these intel reports? Are we talking to people on the ground? Are we combining? We're so data-driven and we rely so much on this. And it was a huge problem in 2016 that we, we, we know what is going on on the ground. And typically at the organizer level, or the volunteer level, the parent level, that's where we hear about this. And we should spend more time focused on what is going right or what is going wrong and, and amplifying that or doing things to fix it while we have time and not giving the Republican Party 30 days of free earned media on these dumb things. Yeah, it does seem that they always have the upper hand in driving the narrative, uh, which is very frustrating. Marissa, I, w- I, I have a question for you. I just want to get back really quickly to Rachel for a second because um, what happened in Virginia should help us. We should learn from it. And the the critical race theory issue, was, was that... Um, was the problem that the Democrats didn't push against it because they didn't take it seriously? Or was Mm -hmm. the problem that the Democrats didn't have anything to say about education in general in Virginia? Well, or some other problem. They want to, I mean, and maybe Adam can speak to this a little bit more. When I went around and talked to people, they, CRT was an issue on people's minds. Um, especially in, Actually, in my neighborhood, I noticed it more, and we live in different counties. So I live in a county that um, is has a little bit more diversity, uh, so less blue in some parts. And I had especially neighbors who who would who asked about CRT and the McAuliffe campaign. Actually, I had a, a phone call with the their head comms person, and and she directly said, we're not talking about CRT because it's not being taught in Virginia schools. Mm -hmm. That you can't do that. When the other side is talking about something, you have to respond. And, and I mean, that's just basic comms, but also I think of it like as a mom, like I might not want to have the birds and the bees talk with my daughter at a certain age, but dude, if they're having it at school, guess it's time to, to, you know, like uh, you get what you get or, as Alex would say, the military, they say the enemy gets a vote. You can have all the plans you want, but you have to react to what's happening. And and this is where, you know, other people. So you can have your strategy, but we have to react to everything else. And I don't think there was a really a good plan on reacting to that. And it was 
fairly easy to counter even me as like an untrained person mm -hmm. um, to say, just just to talk about it with people. And I think they can right. see the logic in it. But I mean, there was, of course, the, the, the McAuliffe gaffe. And that was um, that was an issue. But I think they they relied too heavily on it. And even after immediately after the campaign, they started saying things like, oh, it was because of COVID and schools. Yes. But that's why the CRT thing kind of like it caught fire. And then people were already frustrated and they didn't know how to channel those frustrations. So again, it's about reacting to what's going on and not trying to just run your race without noticing or reacting to anyone else. Cause we can't do that. You can't operate in a vacuum. No. And one thing I want to get to later is I, I personally, and again, I I'm from New York. Uh, which New York City, which in certain instances is a disadvantage because I think I, it makes me narrow minded and I need to stop being narrow minded because uh, it's not like this pretty much anywhere else in the country. Um, but anybody endorsed by Donald shouldn't win anything. Yes. Like it seems that simple to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and Youngkin, I don't think he was that successful at this. I mean, he didn't disavow him, but that's a subject for later um, because Marissa, it, as Rachel was saying, you know, it's very difficult. I think sometimes when you're anticipating a normal campaign in which people have policy differences, or it's, I should say it's difficult for Democrats to pivot and go on the counterattack um, in a very forceful way, especially because they would Certainly in the case of CRT, they would have had truth on their side. Um, and we end up in a position where Democrats are, act, uh, are arguing policy and Republicans are arguing culture war issues. Now, you are in a place that you've described to me as a liberal bubble. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, you know, a, a Republican running for something and throwing the CRT stuff around wouldn't fly where you are. Um, but we now see this full on assault just across. I mean, it's actually getting terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, an assault on trans children, an assault on um, L LGBTQ children and their parents, and, you know, this sexualization of any kind of sexuality that's not hetero. Um, the. Sorry, this makes me very angry. Uh, the linking of, um, you know, being supportive of children in the LGBTQ community or those who have parents in that community, uh, associating people who support those things with grooming and pedophilia and connecting that to the vile attacks on now, thankfully, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson uh, with being soft on pedophilia and running parallel with that, we have the fact that Oklahoma is no longer uh, a place where women are de facto second-class citizens. They are by law. So, you know, it, obviously 2022, all elections are local, pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, and you are in a place where these things don't aren't going to have the same kind of impact, but there are plenty of other places in your state where they will. Mm -hmm. How do you think that, that particularly white women in suburbs, and the reason I'm singling them out is because the majority of them voted for Donald twice, mm -hmm. which seems unthinkable. Um, so how do we message this in a way that drives it home? Uh, because again, this stuff is really dangerous. Messaging things like um, how transgender uh, topics are brought up. Well, no, I mean, like just a more general, like how do people, how do we help people understand what the Republican project really is? I mean, it's like this overarching uh, assault that is being presented as, again, that's eh, just a policy difference. They think this, we think that. No. It's much, it's much more sinister than that. I, um, first things first, I think we have to stop sort of 
being what we traditionally think of as ourselves as Democrats as being these sort of nerdy wonks, said the nerdy wonk, right? And we need to be able to um, spar with the best of them. I, I, and I think, and one of my biggest concerns um, in reaching people on the grassroots level is what if all these people here, and let's just assume that all these people here is Fox News in the corner of their favorite burger joint or what their friend says on Facebook. They're not reading a newspaper. They're not going for analysis. You know, they're not reading that nice big analysis piece on, you know, anywhere. They're not digging deep into the Atlantic or even, you know, a, a more conservative magazine. We have to be much, much better at providing that message on a grassroots level as far as I'm concerned. We have to be able to, in a sense, scare people. When you say that women are no longer second-class citizens, you know, no, they, are. They, are, they are, but now they're legally second-class right. citizens. Um, when I talk to my students and I say to them, hey, do you know what Roe versus Wade is? And they say, no, I don't really know what that is. That's <laughs> Rachel, in case you're not enough. watching, Rachel is shuddering. Um, <laughs> They have no idea. It's it's one thing for me to then say this is what Roe versus Wade is, but I'm not going to get into because it's, you know, my journalism class and I'll get called before the dean. But I'm not going to get into, do you know what happens if you have to get an abortion and it isn't legal? Because they have no sense of that. Right. So there are a lot of like birds in the bees type issues like Rachel was calling them that we need to spread on the grassroots level with everybody and we need to figure out a way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I have this feeling that like the children are the future me and Whitney Houston, also from New Jersey, <laughs> just a few towns over. But um, I look at how much more active, I mean, in my liberal bubble, the kids are. And I, you know, I was talking to my son who's sort of a proto-socialist, he's 16. And he was like, oh yeah, um, how should, I was asking him how they, we should reach out to students? Shouldn't there be civics in school? Shouldn't, you know, they be learning about how important democracy is and how it's on the line? And he's like, no, none of this will have an impact on us because the system is broken. And if the system is broken, you can never fix it. So um, that's why I came upstairs and locked my in this in myself in this room. And it's nice Children to talk to you future? guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see a future. Oh my goodness. Um, but so I'm from Oklahoma, by the way. I, I was I, born and I, raised in Oklahoma. So um, I saw your tweet about that. Yeah. So is, is this a huge <laughs> departure or is this sort of how the evolution of how Oklahoma, uh, you know, Oklahoma, where the wind goes sweeping down the plains and, women and women's nowhere. rights? Um, <laughs> yes. So I will say literally every legislative se uh, session um, for I, maybe five years, Oklahoma has passed uh a restrictive law on abortion that then is found to be unconstitutional. The only thing they have now is they've gotten a little bit more savvy about it, I think, and, and then they're following other states. But Oklahoma is literally number one in nothing, except they now have the most restrictive abortion law in the country. Um, That's and, a bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know, right? <laughs> and I, I don't think this is the will of most of the people, but I think most of the people think it won't affect them. Like I have, we have a 17-year-old niece who lives in Oklahoma and um, a six-year-old niece as well. And um, it's, uh, but I think there's just, people are willing to go along with it because they think they're getting something in return. I think what we need to show them is you're not getting anything in return whatever you, you, whatever you imagine that you're getting from right. this, you're not getting anything. And um, just to go back to something Marissa said about the grassroots movement. I mean, that's one of the things that red wine and blue, which is a political action committee. And um, that I mentioned earlier, that is my podcast, but they truly are a grassroots movement. And what we, what they try to do is train people to go to the school board meetings. Um, you know, we have these troublemaker trainings, but also to have conversations with people. And I learned this and, you know, the don't say gay bill, this just boggles my mind every time I think about it. It was started by a parent who was 
wanted someone to blame because they couldn't come to terms with the fact that their child was either gay or trans. I, I'm sorry, I don't know, but it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. They right. they blamed the school and they couldn't accept it. So they, they've gone through all of this because they couldn't handle something. I, when you think about it in that way, that it was just, it's someone who just is having some real problems with reality. And this is where they're going with it. It's not like right. they want to protect children. It's not, they want to do this. I mean, they wanted some outlet for their frustration. And um, again, other people are like, okay, that's fine. Cause it doesn't affect me. It'll never be my problem. My child's not going to be gay or trans. So what does it matter? And we have so yeah. much apathy and, and again, it's this perception that they're getting what they want. And I think we have to show them you're not getting anything. You would be so much better off with a different plan, um, with, with actual policies, not just people whose only policy seems to be hate. And then, as you mentioned earlier, uh, others who just want to make money off of everything. Yeah, I, I think that one of the worst among the many, many horrific, horrible things that came out of the last administration was this idea that kindness is weakness mm -hmm. and cruelty is strength. Um, so you're right. The fact that um, the one parent or parents were having a problem uh, accepting their child and the response of the state, the school, sorry, my cat is uh, going to destroy. <laughs> I got a six month old bully here who I can't eat. He may have chewed up more papers than uh, Trump in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, because uh, the FBI is more likely to come after your cat than, I mean, your dog than uh, my uncle. It's true. It's true. It's true. Um, and that the, the, the response, the breathtakingly cruel response is to create this entire mechanism to, to punish all children and parents. Uh, who are part of that community. And we see this, I, I apologize, I forget which state and I forget which Republican governor. I should remember it because one of the only Republicans who actually did something decent, uh, he vetoed an anti, uh, a bill that would have, I think made it illegal. Utah. Uh, for, thank you, for parents to get their children um, gender affirming care. <laughs> Oh, no, sorry, sorry. It's uh, trans girls not being allowed to participate in school sports. Mm -hmm. And his point was, um, there are four, it, that would have affected four children directly. They're in the entire, I know there are only like two people in Utah, but still, <laughs> that's a tiny percentage of school students in Utah. And yet, um, the fact of that bill punishes any child who identifies uh, in that group. So Adam, we have um, this really bizarre <laughs> situation where President Biden, and it, listen, it's, it's not just that he's done amazing things with the economy. I don't know how many trillions of jobs as he created, I'm being hyperbolic, but it's many, like millions and millions, more than any other administration in decades and more than all three of the last Republican administrations combined. Um, he has strengthened the Western alliance in a way I don't think any of us would thought would be possible after the cataclysmic four years of Donald. And many other things. Have there been missteps? Yes. Have there been things he's done or hasn't done? I disagree with. Yes. But again, he's done all of this in the context of having to recover from the most destructive anti-American uh, administration in American history or uh, since the Civil War. So <laughs> here we are with all these amazing things. How is it possible that his approval rating is underwater, um, you know, plus, of course, what, what he's yeah, done with NATO sure. uh, in Ukraine. So Adam, what, what is the solution for people on the ground? Because I, I feel like the Democrats always have uh, at least one hand, well, two hands tied behind their back. One, just the, the way government's structured with the Electoral College and the Senate, and two, the media. What, how do we get around those two things or, or work with it uh, to overcome them? It's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I 
know the answer. Uh, We're just thank speculating. Our, thank you. <laughs> we have a, we have eight. We have two hundred and eleven days to come up with this solution. Yeah, you know, I, it's like one of these things where every time we flip from Republicans to Democrats, there's always that chart year after year where you know you look at the economy and others, and Republicans use it one way and we use another, but we use it the right way, which is this is what we were handed. This is what we did. Um, it's it's amazing that you know we're already in year uh, two of this administration. It's gone by quick, but um, thank God he's president. I, I think that it, things changed under Trump and after Trump that you know may never be the same. May never be the same for a very long time. I mean, we have the the oldest you know um, uh, two party system here, right? Like it's not going anywhere. Um, it's the way that that things are run. But I just think that. The damage is done on people. You know, the damage was done to Hillary Clinton and Russia. Um, you know, for all the talk about whether votes were changed, you know, I, I was saying in, in 2016 after the election, you know, put this sort of conspiracy theory conversation aside, votes were changed through perception. When, you, when you're saying that Hillary Clinton did X, Y, and Z, or you've got, you know, foreign actors that a, a, a campaign and staff are working with or are asking what to do, Perceptions are changed, and that changed votes at the voting booth. And with Biden, um, he overcame that and won. Um, and, you know, I have no idea whether or not he's going to run for re-election or not. But in terms of the midterms, you know, after you win the White House, it's kind of like what happened in Virginia. It's a very hard year. It could be an incredibly hard year for Democrats. And I think that we need to, not to compare this to what's going on in Ukraine right now, but I think that a lot of this comes down to weakness invites aggression. And this is, you know, one of the things that that, you know, Putin, you know, thrives on and we need to fight back. We need to be on offense. We can't always be on defense and we need to go out there and we need to hit back harder and we need to do exactly um, uh, what we want to do is take our base. You know, we can't spend this time focused on whether or not we're going to change this mind. You know, if that person uh, needs all of our time to come around, then we're not doing the right thing. Republicans focus on their base. We right. stand for the right things. And I think if we can focus on talking to people about what we're doing and focus on energizing and exciting our base, that is going to turn into a win side for Democrats. Absolutely. That, that has always been something about Democrat, the Democratic Party that's mystified me. One is also that they never made the Supreme Court the <laughs> issue it really needed to be. Um, and just as a quick aside, though, you know, it's another thing that is amazing. Uh, Biden's work on the economy, despite COVID, despite what he inherited is incredible. All anybody pays attention to is uh, inflation. And last I checked, he just made sure that uh, the Supreme Court now has its very first, which is on the one hand, a source of pride and great shame uh, <laughs> for the country. Um, the very first black black woman. Um, and yet uh, the subject always gets changed somehow, Marissa. Uh, it's like, Adam just said it. We forget our base. and mm -hmm. and this is I think part part of that is um, semantic, right? the The media treat both bases equally in the sense they refer to the Republican base, they refer to the Democratic base. Mm -hmm. However, the Republican base, the people who support Donald are white supremacists. They're neo-Nazis. They're the kind of people who want to take away my rights. They want to take away the rights of any person of color and we see it with extreme gerrymandering. You see what DeSantis is doing with his despicable takeover of drawing the maps in Florida. And we know why he's doing it. He's doing that so it'll go to the Supreme Court and this corrupt court led by John Roberts, who's been trying to destroy voting rights in this country since t the 20 aughts or teens. Um, he's trying to take the whites rights away, whites, <laughs> the rights away of people of color um, so how do we, I just lost my train of thought because I went on a tangent and I got mad again. Oh, cause it's so frustrating. So because, it, oh, right. So in our base is just, you know, it's us, it's 
it's women of color are the backbone of this party. And time after time, you know, they're called upon to make sure Democrats win. And then it's like, see in two years, mm -hmm. see right. in four years. So there's that. But then there's also not simply that we we actually have policies that want, will help people. We're, we have right on our side. Like we should be anger angry in a way that's righteous because they're the ones who are trying to destroy our country. How do, it just feels like keep, things just keep getting lost in translation. And I'm, is it because people are just tired? <laughs> you know, it's been a really long, well, certainly I, two, uh, and for a lot of us, five years. I think it's unfortunate that the um, Republicans have given their base the important words to use in their campaigns. Patriotism, right? Um, health care for all. We should be talking about health care for all, but they talk about it as something bad. And they manage to take all these things that we as Democrats are want to provide, want to do for people, um, want to make nice for people, and they somehow have managed to skew it and ro royal their base. We need to take back those words, mm -hmm. right? What's yeah. being patriotic, right? We'll tell you what's being patriotic and go from there, right? Patriotic is actually helping your neighbor by chipping in and all of us having health care or, you know, or being a good neighbor is making sure insulin prices are something everyone can afford. And we've got the leaders who make that happen. Okay, there's your t-shirt. Um, but I, 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 I'm being, I'm not being, I'm being flipped now. I wasn't being flipped before. Um, I think it's really, they're important words that, are really simple for people to take on and we need mm -hmm. to own them. Yeah, exactly. And and it it isn't it isn't complicated. In fact, I just spoke to somebody who uh, Marissa knows quite well who said that, you know, uh, Democrats bring a 30-page white paper to a you know, a bazooka fight or whatever. Um and it it is so simple. In fact, uh, I mean, Rachel, I think that all we need to, not all, but I, we should so, totally lead with, um, you know, vote for democracy in 2022, uh, yeah. <clears throat> right? I think it's and the only choice. It is the only choice, but people don't, uh, because as, as, as Marissa just said, the Republicans have always actually had credit where credit is due, been brilliant at co-opting our language. Mm -hmm. You know, when they mm -hmm. started using my body, my choice oh. about masks and right. COVID, I, I mean, if, if it was a good thing, I was trapped in my house, let's put it that way. Um, Cause I was a, a apoplectic, but it's the, it's the truth. And, and yet how difficult is it to say, you know, why people uh, are suffering because of fl inflation, which is, all right, I'm going on way too long about it. But, you know, if if you want to help people deal with inflation, then pay them a living wage, which, mm -hmm. by the way, the Republicans don't want to do. Mm -mm. Right now, uh, it's a, you know, just in what Marissa was saying, all I was thinking was, yes, we need to explain this to people. And guess where you're not going to do that? In um, a long format piece in the New Yorker or the That's Atlantic, right. because, exactly. you know, um, which both, by the way, are magazines to which I subscribe. And my husband's like, uh, do you read these? And uh, I just, uh, you know, say that I have uh, plans to. You're brave enough but, to admit it. <laughs> um, yes. But I, you know, I mean, look, like what Adam was talking about, about how things have kind of changed with Trump. So one of the things that um, you call him Donald, I, call him, I don't know him that well, but um, yeah, but he hates being called Donald. So I okay. think everybody should call him Donald. That's awesome. Well, uh, one of the things that Donald did was <laughs> change the way we communicate and the way we receive information from our leadership. And I think there was this idea, like, we're going to elect Joe Biden, and it's going to be great. And things had this like feeling like it's going to get back to normalcy. Yes, they were like moaning about all this stuff, but we thought it would go away. And then January 6 happened. And on that day, that's when it needed to be like knives out. Like we're mm -hmm. not going back. And still there's a lot of people who aren't on team knives out and they don't understand that we've got to change the way we're communicating because people were used to being talked to 
by the president for, you know, four years while he was in office and then other time, you know, before that as a candidate. And, and so it got to be this. And yes, it's nice that we have like a responsible adult as president, but there's kind of this idea with a lot of people of like, wait, why isn't he talking to us more? Why, why aren't we communicating these things more? Why aren't people going on, um, you know, like instead of Fox News and OANN or whatever every night and, and giving a just, just repeating talking points like it's propaganda about the things that, that Trump did? Why don't we have the equivalent of that? But instead, it's, well, Yes, Joe Biden is a great president. But let me tell you, in the 25 years I've been in the Senate, we <laughs> have helped agriculture in ways that are just amazing. And like, it's good. <laughs> it's all good stuff. But but there's this, this, like, sometimes things just happen. It's not the hot button issues. And guess what? You just got to do it to do it and then move on. But don't talk about that. You got to talk about the stuff that really matters to people or find a way to talk about the 25 years that you've been working on this agriculture bill and put that into like a sentence and tell people how their lives are better because of it. But if you can't distill it, then you're going to have to move on to something else because no one cares. And it's just the reality of where we are. I mean, like, I mean, Adam's the comms person and Marissa is the journalism person. So I'm just like the, the mom on the street who doesn't have time to read the articles. So y you need to explain it to me to where I get it. And that is where I think we're failing so much. And, and I mean, this is how people want to receive information. So we've got to find a way to give it to them there in that place. You Good, better, and different. I know you don't like it. No one likes it, okay? But this is where we are right now, so. I agree with you. I like you whatever know, works. <laughs> right. And, you know, one of the ways I, to your point, Rachel, one of the ways I, like, teach my kids in my class how to edit themselves is to give them a very long paragraph and say, you have to make this into a tweet. Mm -hmm. And it really teaches you how to edit <laughs> because we use so many useless words every Sent every policy that we have as Democrats should be tweetable, mm -hmm. right? Or it should have a great memeable thing. And I don't mean that we all have to like make it all like TikTok. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm speaking to Rachel's point, which is it needs to be concise. And gosh darn it, can we have an American flag on everything? Oh. I really mean <laughs> no. it about no, but that's I'm the patriotic part. Uh, yeah. No, I had to was it before Alex's. Okay book came out we were in new york because he had his first like things in new york and so i was he wanted to find an american flag lapel pen so i go on this track to find an american flag lapel pen which you can actually easily find at souvenir shops it wasn't even difficult he was like i want to wear the flag i want to take it back for everyone it doesn't have to be something that just they do and um now you know that he is you american ukrainian flag pen They've gotten really popular, but, uh, and, and he had one just because anytime you work at an embassy, you get one, um, but the, or, you know, whatever your host nation and the American flag, but I see more people wearing the American flag with the Ukrainian flag than wanted to wear it before because people didn't want to be thought of as being part of the crazy because they co-opted it. And it's ridiculous. Same with the word liberty and he was said patriot, like right. stop, like just take it back. Um, it's it's not really that hard. Uh, just take it back for for our, for everyone. It's all of ours. And and you saw my reaction. I mean, I I hate flags, for because, what? well, just all flags. Like and not just not. I, mm -hmm. I don't hate flags. What I'm saying is, no, I understand. I hate the fact that they're I, I, used. People use them to say I'm more patriotic than you are because yes. I'm a flag. Right. right. Yeah. That's what, that's all I mean. Absolutely. So that's what I think of you know, when you say we should wear the flag. But you're right. We need to take back these symbols, and we need to um, be able to say in the most concise language possible what we stand for, as you've been saying, because literally what the Republicans are saying is Democrats are pedophiles. Democrats want to groom your, they are literally saying these things. Democrats are grooming your children. Joe Biden is pro pedophilia. It is just absolutely gobsmacking. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, we actually have powerful messages that, I mean, we, I don't know, do you counter that? I have no idea. It's sort of like the CRT thing. I mean, but I, I guess you have to, because it's so obscene. You can't just let it I think go. Of this, it's, it's all projection. It, <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my God, yeah. about attacking Democrats uh, mm -hmm. saying that they're groomers, when in fact, you know, Ron DeSantis and Florida Republicans seem to care more about kids' genitals than anybody else. Um, it's the same people on the topic of the flag who uh, say they're the patriotic ones and they're, they're uh, Republican members of Congress and senators are the ones that celebrate the 4th of July in Moscow. So That's right. Everything right. you're saying, I totally agree with you. There's nothing annoys me more than when, when using the word, you know, patriot, and everyone's like, please stop, don't use that. I mean, I, I think that the almost uh, on the flag topic, the silver lining of Ukraine is Ukraine is showing the world what many of us, especially those of us that Ukrainian Americans have known for a long time. However, it's getting people to go out there and put up the U.S. flag and, and the Ukrainian flag who have been flag people, who have been patriots. Um, but it drives me nuts. So much of this stuff, especially what's coming out of Florida, I'm still annoyed at the, the conversation we were just having about what's going on in Florida. Yeah. What Republicans are saying and using in their attacks is you literally can just take that attack and use it against them because they are the ones doing that. That's right. That's right. And it seems, uh, getting back to the patriotism thing, um, when Republicans use that word, and, and the reason, again, I, I kind of said the chill down my spine is because they mean, it means it's jingoism when they use it. Mm -hmm. And I think Democrats need to start letting people know that being a patriot means being pro-democracy. Yeah. Being a patriot, Zelensky defending his capital, not attacking. Right. That's right, and and reminding people that you know, a month and a half ago, all of these Republicans claiming they give a shit about Ukraine were pro Donald, pro Putin. I mean, they're still pro Donald, but I mean, it's been going on for years. They didn't indict. Uh, they didn't uh, find him guilty in the Senate when he clearly um, broke the law by denying desperately needed aid to Ukraine so they could protect themselves from this kind of illegal invasion. And they can turn around. And the fact that, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm sort of rambling because there's so many, so many ways to turn and so many things to think about because, some of its policies, some of its language, some of its accountability. We have, there were two people on the Judiciary Committee who treated Justice Jackson with such dripping contempt. They are seditionists. They are active seditionists. They belong in prison. So Adam, what, <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? I think Rachel's right. You, on January 6th, that was when you take the fucking knives out. And you yeah. just don't <clears throat> drop it. You hammer it and you hammer it and you hammer it. There is no uniting with these people. And I'm just whipping myself up into a yeah. I mean, this is the, <laughs> the Republicans are the party of Ted Cruz who, you know, you, you can go on all night, but, you know. <laughs> Please don't. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, the, the, we had an insurrection where they went by Ted Cruz's desk and they said, he's with us. This is the same guy who lifted up the, Republic, uh, the um, uh, Russian military while attacking uh, the U.S. military, and the Russian military is now raping women and children. I mean, it is, it's, it drives me nuts, but I think it goes back to the start of this entire conversation, which is uh, people like Rachel, um, who, you know, former Republican, a mom, she's, you know, when, when I was last at her house, it was a little bit of a drive, um, and she knows what's going on, and we got to listen to people like her, and we need to, you know, make sure that we lift that up. And those are the folks who are going to tell us whether or not we're, we're already doing the right things. We're, yeah. you know, we're playing by the rules and, you know, we, we have the facts on our side, but you know, if it's not resonating, then we need to pivot and we can't, you know, wait until two weeks out from an election when many of these people have already made up their minds. Yeah. And, you know, Marissa, that's one thing that worries me. Um, we personally are where we live. I mean, we don't have to do anything because we're in very liberal places. I'm in Manhattan for God's sakes. <laughs> um, but even though all of the elections are local this time around, 
we cannot underestimate the importance of this election. If Democrats lose in 2022, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not going to give up, but uh, the the hill we have to climb towards 2022, 2024, sorry, becomes, uh, you know, K-9. Um, is that the name of the mountain, the very high mountain? K-2. Thank you. Not the dog <laughs> patrol. <laughs> The, high, the very high mountain. Paw Patrol will save us. <laughs> Paw Patrol on K2. Uh, so I feel like it's completely down to us. I, I don't I don't want to count our elected representatives out. There are some brilliant, truly patriotic people on our side in Congress. Um, but you know, I I agree uh, with Rachel as well that it's um, it's going to be a person by person fight. Uh, it's going to be getting out the message in a way that resonates with actual human beings who don't read the Atlantic um, or you know the New York Times editorial page. And you know, one thing I'm not saying Democrats don't do this, but it's even more important now. Um, we need to meet people where they are unless of course, and I, this is the, this is the last thing I want to ask you guys. Cause I don't want to keep you forever. Although I certainly could. Um, I kind of feel like if somebody voted for Donald in 2016, that's a different issue. People didn't know as much as I certainly thought they should have about who he was. Um, if people voted for him in 2020, I'm done. I'm not having that conversation. I kind of feel like our efforts need to be absolutely with people who, you know, voted for Biden, but then voted for Youngkin, for example, or, you know, voted for Obama, but didn't vote uh, in 2020, whatever. Uh, people who, who never vote, people who stop voting. Um, do you guys feel the same way? I'll start with you, Rachel, that, that we just need to laser focus on uh, people whose minds can be if not changed, then uh, people who could be encouraged. Let's put that. Yeah, way. no, I, I I agree that I'm done with people who voted for um, Trump in 2020. And then Sharon just had a comment that I saw that we should call out every time the Republicans spew lies. And I'll tell you why I think this is important. I've been going out more because um, COVID has kind of ended, sort of. I don't even know. I'm very confused by this, but. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I've been going out more. Um, <laughs> I went to the gridiron and I didn't get a COVID like everyone else there. So I feel a little bit like. <laughs> you, seriously? Um, That's wow. We did. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was on pins and needles because Alex was like, there was only one person between Alex and Dr. Fauci. And I was like, oh my God, if either one of oh us get and we gave Dr. Fauci COVID, I would <laughs> never go to live with myself. But I think we're all clear. Anyway, so I do think it's important. And this is why I think it's important because. When we call people out, that excites our base. So that might not change anyone's mind, but that's why I think the Twitter game is really important. Adam is so good at this. You know, we, we've got to call it out and say it, and that reminds people what we're fighting for and what we're doing here. We are fighting to counter this bullshit. And yeah. that's why it matters because these people over here. So maybe we don't like when we have a conversation, we're a little bit more refined when we have a conversation with someone and we're just trying to explain the facts, but that keeps us motivated. And that's like, I mean, you know, you would know more of the psychology behind it, but I think it just is a way to keep us a little bit more focused on that and the importance of it. And people say this to me a lot, which is why I have this opinion. I mean, I could be wrong, but I do feel like that, that part of it is important. And then you know, we, we've got to talk to people and we've got to tell people why their lives are better now they in they are it's it's incontrovertible that there are things being done that are making people's lives better but it does need to be communicated it's not all uh, it, it's not as intuitive as you might think and um people need to see the difference and and i think that so so those two things i think we got to keep up with this, this understanding keep everyone motivated and then we just have to keep talking about those messages and i agree with you like 
I would love for some of these politicians to go for the jugular and just say it. Like, I would love for them to call them out on their, like, every time they do it. But they're not going to. That's not their brand. And we're not going to change them. But we can do it for them. We can be their their proxies and we can do it. And I think it's just a really important role that we play. Yeah, absolutely. And now Marissa is from Joyzy. So she has no compunction. We're going to go to the mattresses. uh, That's what you guys talk about, right? That's uh, your Jersey in New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuck it, man. Right? I mean, you're just going to go swear at at people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But liberal bubble or not, Marissa, I mean, we we have to help people, I think, understand um, the broad consequences of these very local races because it, it, it will change the course of history. Right. <laughs> local races and potential, <laughs> but it's true. Um, local races typically get big voter turnout or not. Anybody? Right? It's it's a you know it's a harder um, it's it's a harder it's harder for us. But I think with a with to all of Rachel's points, I agree one hundred percent. I think punching the bully in the nose is yes. really how we can do it. And I think you can punch the bully in the nose on a local level better than you're going to get some folks in Congress to be the people who mm-hmm. spew um, the the truth, who <laughs> spew the truth, yeah. who, who speak, I think it's called speaking the truth, you know? So yeah. maybe that's our hope with the local level is that we can really start a groundswell of, wait a second, we actually have been the, the right ones. Um, and this, and this is, you know, this is why your gas is going up. It actually has nothing to do with Joe Biden. What it has right. to do with is X, Y, Z. Thank you. Right? <laughs> Anytime. It's $5. not that hard. $0.89. Cents. It's happening um, all over the world. You know, it's. it's hap- and also we have um, a task of getting people to vote. So that's, is that another show? <laughs> Listen, like I said, we have 211 days. I don't know how many shows that is, but we have time um, because all of this is true. And we saw what happened uh, in the first round of French elections. Um, turnout was way down, which give, gave Le Pen more of an opening than she might have had. Um, but basically, despite, I don't care that it's an, a, a midterm election off your off your election, so-called. Um, we need to, as both of you just said, help people understand why it matters. Uh, I thought this needed to happen in 2020 and unfortunately didn't. I, th- I felt that we, we need, the Democrats needed to win by an enormous margin um, and we underperformed in both the House and the Senate uh, because that would have been the only way to repudiate so-called Trumpism. That did not happen. I do believe that needs to happen now. I think if we give people the proper context and as you say, punch the bully in the nose, we are much more um, liable to to help that happen. Um, Adam, other than that, can you think of, uh, you know, what, you have a tremendous amount of experience and, and not just experience, but a tremendous win record. Um, you know, you are a consummate professional when it comes to this stuff. And, and again, I'm not looking for solutions where it's in some ways it's not early days at all. Eight months goes very quickly, but in some ways it is, you know, we have time. So what is the most effective use of our resources at this stage of the game? Well, I'll say, um, I also have a great loss record and, uh, it's one of the, one of the things I love about everybody here, including Mary is that, um, that we need to compete everywhere. And, yes, and totally Rachel, agree. And early on, she talked about Dan Helmer, who's a local uh, rep here in Virginia. I, I think that's key. Is is one? Not only do these local electeds have almost you know more more things they can do for you on a daily basis and affect over your life every single day right. than, than we ever talk about because we get focused on the national things. But you know, as, um, as former First Lady Michelle Obama said years ago, um, and it's something that I try to always talk about is these local elections, if, if we have inspiring candidates that we get excited about, we get behind them, every single one of them, if, if we're getting behind them and bringing out voters and they're coming out to vote for Dan Helmer, they're going to vote for the statewide race. And I think sometimes we do get a little, from a, from a national you know, party standpoint, too focused and top heavy, where we, we need to make sure that we, in and, and Ohio and others, even though they, 
you know, they're more red. They've been focused the last couple of years on making sure that every single one of these seats has someone running it. Um, and I know there's a number of organizations focused on that, but I think that's key. I think it's the, these local races, let's do everything we can to lift people up, support them, get the word out. And as we've seen in a number of these viral videos, including this incredible elected official um, in Kentucky, um, you know, who's the only, not only the only female in the room, but the only doctor. Right. Um, they, you know, these are the people that uh, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can. So I totally agree. And then looking along past this, I, uh, you know, we can walk and, and chew gum at the same time. Right. I kind of love this whole Donald Ronald fight. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, uh, Trump, you know, he loves to see everybody uh, humiliated, including his own family members that are with him now, um, and, unless it's him. Um, and I think he made an error on the DeSantis stuff. So I think with DeSantis's, uh, I asked, didn't know that was DeSantis's first name. That's his start. Yeah, At right. first, I thought you meant Reagan. I'm like, I think he's dead. Everything we can to pin these two against each other because not only is uh, Donald live in, in Florida, but I think that uh, he's real pissed off about Ron DeSantis. What a shame. I'm jealous. <laughs> I think he's very uh, jealous that anyone uh, yes. would get attention and not him. Well, you know, that's why we see him act out from time to time, because, uh, you know, he's on a timeout. Mm -hmm. When you yes. did say Donald versus Ronald, I started, I wasn't thinking of Ron DeSantis, because I really don't like to. But I started thinking, oh, Ronald Reagan versus Donald. Maybe they <laughs> should, they should, br we should bring back the whole, like, maybe I should sell this to the Republican. But the idea that, like, the Republicans really should go back to what, you know, to more Ronald Reagan But times. Ronald Reagan <laughs> wouldn't be accepted in this Republican Party. No. And he was not what we would call a good guy, nice person. <laughs> no. and There's a the video still floating around online somewhere where I think it was Donald Trump, uh, Bush, and, and, and one other man was Reagan, whoever it was debating themselves. And uh, so anyways, we'll have to circulate that after because it shows you what it would look like with the old party versus today. And it, it's truly something. Yeah, it, it's I, I mean, the the de-evolution of the Republican Party is something that we all need to take very, very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Although when you said Donald versus Ronald, the first thing that came into my mind was Ronald McDonald. So <laughs> that's anyway. actually OK. I think thank you, because that's what I was thinking. Oh, OK, as well, I was like, uh, well, I we mean, can be I, honest I, here. I figured it out, but I mean, it's kind of appropriate because isn't he like McDonald's? So, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, he, so did, he, he did ham uh, serve people hamburgers or McDonald's. Fast yeah, food. like a $10,000 a table uh, event. I really, but. I just can't, like, how is this our world? And, and you need to allow yourself those moments of just like, absolute, like, how is this happening? Yeah. And then let, get back in the fight. But I think yes. it's okay to acknowledge, like, I can't believe this is my life and or this is our collective life as yeah. a nation, but it is. And this is the fight we have for today. You know, um, that's right. As ridiculous as it is, like it has chosen us and we have to rise to the occasion. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it, listen, it's it's exhausting mm -hmm. and it can be demoralizing. And um, as I think I say this, that like, every time I talk to somebody, partially because I'm trying to convince myself, but it is true. There are more of us than there are of them. There are, just are. And I think it is okay to take a break and to just laugh at the absurdity of things because it is just it's freaking absurd, um, but also dangerous and serious and, and all of that. But honestly, like I, I don't know how I would get through it without people like you on on the the right side of things because even though there are more of us than there are them, it can be pretty lonely, uh, it can. right? It, you know, especially mm -hmm. even even not that we're entirely post COVID, but even still. So um, Adam Parkamenko, Marissa Rothkoff, Rachel Vindman, I am so grateful you're here. I am so grateful to the work you are all doing. It's incredibly important. You motivate me, uh, you help me stay focused, and um, I really hope to have you back uh, sometime soon. So thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. It's a thank pleasure. You very much.
Uh, just to wrap up quickly, first of all, thank you so much uh, to my extraordinary guests. Um, I learn so much from them whenever I talk to them. It really helps me stay sane. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, that there was a shooting in New York. Uh, I have not checked in on the details for a while, uh, but uh, in Brooklyn, a, a gunman shot into a crowded subway crowd uh, during rush hour this morning. Last I heard, at least 18 people were injured. And um, all we knew at the very beginning of this was that the alleged shooter was a black man wearing an orange uh, like construction vest. That's all we knew. And yet, a journalist uh, referred to the attack as not classic terrorism before we really had any information about anything. So the implication of saying that, of course, was that because the, uh, the gunman had been identified as not Muslim, um, it couldn't possibly have been an act of classic terrorism because I guess a lot of people think that only Muslims carry those out. So that was pretty disgraceful. It made a horrific situation uh, even worse. So um, way to perpetuate damaging stereotypes media. Please do better. Anyway, um, hopefully it was a, a single, a solitary incident, nothing coordinated and um, as a New Yorker, I know the city has been through a lot and we always uh, we always get through it, but uh, that doesn't mean it isn't hard. So my thoughts to everybody in Brooklyn right now. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, I, I really value your watching or listening. I think these strategy sessions are really, really, really important and um, you know, you're supporting them is, is valuable, uh, you know, and you're getting the word out is really helpful because I think the more people who hear um, others talking about the 2022 elections in a strategic way, the more educated we all become. As I said, I learn something every single time and, and you know, we just need to get better at this. So we win in 2022. Uh, you can catch uh, my next weekly strategy session uh, on youtube.com slash Politicon next Tuesday, 7 p.m., 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. But before that, we'll have our usual Thursday night show in two days, uh, at also at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, so every week on Thursdays, we'll have a, new, a different... Um, person on for a one-on-one -on -one interview. And every Tuesdays we'll have a different panel uh, talking about strategy uh, for the upcoming midterms. So it would really help too if you follow Politicon on YouTube and there's a bell, I always point the wrong way. There's a bell that you can press and if you do, then that way, every time there's a new show, whether it's Tuesday or Thursday, you will be alerted. So please do that as well. And don't forget, you can listen to this show in podcast form uh, at Apple or anywhere else you get uh, your podcasts. And please remember to give the show a five-star rating because it really, really does help other people find the show. Uh, thank you again so much for being here. I appreciate all of you. Stay safe and be kind. Um.